Well, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are, uh, and welcome to the latest in our webinar series. Today, we're going to look at some of the investment and business opportunities that make UK such an attractive investment destination. As wherever investing abroad, wherever abroad might be for you, there are a number of factors that need to be considered. And our expert speakers will talk about some of those factors which are specific to the UK, be it taxation or immigration. My name's Alf Torrance and I'm the Executive Director of the RBCC. And today's speakers are from Lawrence Grant, a well-known consultancy that provide expert taxation and consult accountancy advice. Based in North London, they have an international footprint through their CGI network of professionals in over 120 countries. I'm delighted to welcome Alan Raja, a partner at Lawrence Grant, and Vandana Das from Davenport Solicitors, who will be providing the legal expertise today. We're very grateful for, to both of you for joining us today. And of course, as always, thank you to all RBCC members and friends for participating. Before we get started, I'd just like to run very quickly uh, over some ground rules. Um, after I finished, Alan and Vandana will be making some presentations. I'm sure many of you will want to ask Alan and Vandana questions afterwards. So please use the chat room function and myself and the team will pick out some of the more popular themes. Throughout, we'll have everyone on mute. So um, if you're asking a question, obviously unmute yourself, but most importantly, remute yourself once you've finished. As is traditional, we'll record the webinars, which we'll post uh, on the website tomorrow or the day after. Um, both um, Alan and uh, Vandana very kindly agreed to make the pre their presentations available, and we will post those on the website or we'll send them to you direct if you would like. Um, if you'd like to follow up on any issues with Lawrence Grant, um, the details are on the website. Um, if you can't find those, just get in contact with the RBCC team or, of course, with Lawrence Grant direct. Alan, um, COVID-19 has turned the world upside down. How has it impacted on inward investment? Thank you, Al, for the introduction. Uh, let me first share my screen with you. Hopefully I can have control of screens. Uh, you to enable me as host. Lewis, could you, you enable yep. me as host? Yeah. Yeah, Lewis, please. Yeah. Your co host. Great, we can see that. Great, thank you. Thank you all for the introduction. Uh, today I'm gonna to discuss the investment and business opportunities in the UK, as well as the regulatory requirements in setting up a business in the UK. I'll also be discussing the changes in capital gains tax, which will now affect foreigners who own both residential and commercial properties in the UK. Just get back to the main slide. Uh, as Al mentioned, I've been in practice for over 25 years and I've been advising personal and corporate clients on steps they should be taking before setting up a business or relocating to the UK. Uh, we are independent members of GGI, an alliance of accountants, lawyers and consultants based in 124 countries. We're currently ranked as the sixth largest network in the world. We have multilingual staff, including Russian speaking staff, so we can advise most foreigners coming to the UK. As I'll mention, 2020 has been an extremely challenging time for all of us, and most countries have been struggling to contain the coronavirus. UK is no different in this aspect, and this has impacted most businesses, especially those that are on the high street. With UK back in lockdown, the UK's economy recovery has gone into reverse. Uh, GDP is expected to decline by around 7% in November, by 2% in the final quarter, by, and by 11% for 2020 as a whole. To compound matters, uh, we have Brexit looming around the corner, and UK has yet to come to an agreement with the EU. Although UK has negotiated a trade deal with Japan, there's still a huge challenge for UK to navigate post-Brexit. UK is also on the brink of signing a trade deal with Canal, and we just heard that today. 
How I am confident that the deal will be done with the EU in the near, before 31st December. We also see an increase in number of inquiries from European companies looking to set up business in the UK. This is mainly due to strict working time EU directives, as well as high taxes imposed in the Eurozone. Ron's Grant has, has been established for over 50 years, and our client base is North America, Europe, Middle East, Africa, Russia, Asia, and Australia. We cover a number of industries, including retail, manufacturing, IT, healthcare, insurance, education, hospitality, as well as professionals. Most of our clients have some IT presence that has enabled them to continue trading during this difficult time. However, some of our clients in the healthcare sector have been seeing a huge drop in income as they've been unable to undertake operations. Despite the challenges that we're facing at the moment, there are a number of opportunities in some industries and they include investment in real estate, including residential buy-to-let, as well as property development. I'll cover the tax incentives that the government has provided to stimulate the housing industry later in the presentation. The commercial sector and real estate has taken a huge hit, but I believe there's some good bargains in the sector. The one thing that's done extremely well is warehousing. As consumers move from retail to online shopping, uh, the values in this sector has increased and this sector has owned mainly by pension funds. Our clients are finding it hard to secure good warehousing and the problem is further compounded by Amazon's plans to expand in the UK. There's no doubt that the hospitality and hotel industries have been severely impacted by COVID-19, but this has also presented some opportunities for investors looking to get into the market. There's some industries that have continued to grow during the pandemic, and this includes business in the service industries, such as IT support, development and implementation, Process automation in, is where the future of the business will be conducted and we've been assisting our clients to automate their systems and processes. The financial service industry continues to thrive in the current climate as the individual and companies require financial advice to navigate through the current pandemic. As more people are looking for jobs, recruitment companies are busier than ever in trying to relocate staff, especially in the service industry. Some of the winners during the pandemic in the retail industry include clients in the fast food industry. So some of our clients operate franchise models in the fast food industry, which has been doing extremely well during this crisis. As we all know, most consumers have switched to online business and most of our clients are doing a booming trade at the moment. It goes without saying that during a crisis, any international trading enables a business to have a high chance of survival and we've been able to assist those clients in opening new markets by using trusted advisors in new jurisdictions. I'm gonna discuss the regulatory requirements in setting up a business in the UK. So there are different type of businesses in the UK you can trade as, such as sole trader, partnership, limited library partnership, also known as LLP, and limited company. I'll go through each of the possible options in the next slides. In order to set up as a sole trader, you'll need to register with Her Majesty Revenue and Customs, also known as HMRC. Depending on the type of business, you'll need to register for value added tax, also known as VAT. The VAT registration limit in the UK is 85,000 pounds per annum. What this means is that if your turnover exceeds 85,000 pounds on a rolling 12 months, you'll be obliged to register for VAT. You also need to complete accounts and tax return every year. Any tax due will be payable on 31st January each year. In order to establish a partnership, you must have more than one member. You also need to register with HMRC. Again, depending on the type of business, you'll need to register for VAT. Some businesses such as medical practices, and financial institutions are exempt from VAT registration. You also need to complete the partnership accounts and tax returns every year. 
The tax levy is on the individual and not the partnership. The individual will need to pay tax uh, due on 31st January each year. In order to set up a limited liability partnership, which is also known as LLP, you must have more than one member and the second member could be a corporate member. And that's the difference between the uh, regular partnership. The LLP will need to register with Company House and HMRC. Again, depending on the type of business, the LLP will need to register for value added tax. As with sole trade and simple partnership, uh, the LLP will need to complete accounts and tax return every year. The main difference with an LLP is that you'll need to submit accounts to Company House and HMRC. So your accounts are publicly available to everyone that needs to, that may search your, your, your LLP on the, on the Company House website. The tax library is on the individual and not the LLP. Uh, the members of the LLP will need to pay any tax due on 31st January each year. An important tax planning tip for the LLP is that if all trading income and members are outside the UK, there'll be no tax payable in the UK. In order to set up a limited company, you'll need a minimum of one director and one shareholder. The director and shareholder can be outside the UK. Uh, you also need to register the company with Company House and HMRC. Again, depending on the type of business, you need to register for value added tax. The director will need to complete accounts and tax returns every year and also will need to submit accounts to Company House and HMRC. Uh, the tax levy is payable by, by the company and the company will need to pay tax within nine months of the year end. Uh, there are a number of tax planning opportunities in setting up a company that includes uh, where there's no withholding tax and dividends declared. A UK holding company are exempt from capital gains tax when a subsidy is sold either in the UK or abroad. Loans Grant will be able to assist you in setting up onshore and offshore tax solutions by using a UK limited company. By far, the most popular choice in setting up a business in the UK is by incorporating a company. I'll briefly discuss the incorporation process in the UK as well as the tax implication in the UK. Okay. So a UK company can be set up within 24 hours of receiving the due diligence documents. Uh, you can use a Loans Grant as a user office rather than having an office space uh, in, in London. Like most countries around the world, the biggest challenge is opening a bank account in the UK. And we're able to provide nominee director services to meet your compliance requirements in the UK. There are a number of taxes payable in the UK and I'll briefly discuss each of these taxes. Corporate taxes payable by companies and the current tax rate is 19%. Uh, the corporation tax is payable nine months after the year end and you'll need to file your accounts and tax return with HMRC within 12 months after the year end. The VAT rate for most businesses in the UK is 20%. Uh, due to COVID-19, the government has introduced a 5% VAT rate for the hospitality, hotel and holiday industry. The 5% rate will be in place until 12 January 2021. Some goods and services such as Home energy is charged at 5%. And there's also a zero rate for some goods and services such as food and children's clothing. You can complete a monthly, quarterly, or annual VAT return. And the choice is yours. You'll need to file and, and pay your VAT library one month and seven days after the monthly or quarterly VAT period. Inheritance tax, also known as debt duties, is taxed at 40% on an individual's estate. Their tax-free allowances are up to one million pounds before the 40% is applied, but the allowances will not apply to everyone. Foreigners are also subject to inheritance tax for assets held in the UK. Moving on to payroll taxes. Uh, if you employ staff in the UK, you'll need to account for payroll taxes. And this includes employee national insurance contributions where the tax is up to 12% on gross salary. Employee national insurance contributions is taxable at 13.8% on gross salary. Uh, pay as you earn, also known as PAYE taxes, range between 20% to 45%. And the way a business operates a PAYE scheme, the taxes are payable 22 days after the month end. If you buy and sell goods, 
uh, fixed assets in the UK, you'll need to pay capital gains tax, also known as CGT, on the gain that you make. Uh, CGT only applies to individuals, while companies pay corporation tax on any gains they make. For individuals, uh, any gains on sale of assets except residential property will be subject to either 10% or 20% tax. This is dependent on the individual's uh, lower rate or higher rate tax bracket. If you make a gain on residential properties, the tax is either 18% or 28%. I'll discuss further details on uh, the changes in capital gains tax later in the presentation. The annual tax on envelope dwellings, also known as ATED, is payable on residential properties that are owned by UK companies or offshore structures. The ATED tax is payable depending on the value of the property. The tax payable uh, is from £3,700 to £236,000 per annum. The added tax applies to any resident property over the value of half a million pounds, and the added tax is payable every year. Standard land tax, also known as the SDLT, applies to purchase of properties. The SDLT rates range from 5% to 12%, on residential properties. There's also an additional 3% standard land tax payable when you purchase a second residential property. Due to COVID-19, the government introduced an incentive where no SDLT will be payable on property values up to half a million pounds. And this incentive will open until uh, March, 2021. Uh, this SDLT rate on non-resident properties range from 1% to 5%. Although the UK has introduced a raft of taxes, there are a number of tax allowances and relief available in the UK. When you purchase fixed assets in the UK, you may be entitled to claim capital allowances. So the current annual investment allowance, also known as AIA, of one million pounds was due to, due to end on 31st December, 2020. However, due to the pandemic, the government has actually extended this allowance until 1st January, 2022. The writing down allowance, also known as WDA rate is 18% and 100% first sale allowances may be available. The government has introduced the Enterprise Investment Scheme, also known as EIS, for individuals to invest in private companies in the UK. You can make a maximum investment of one million pounds per annum and you receive income tax relief of 30%. Any gain you make from an investment will be exempt from capital gains tax if the investment is held for three years. Seed Enterprise Investment Scheme, also known as SEIS, is a much more attractive scheme. Uh, the maximum investment that a taxpayer can make is 100,000 pounds per annum, and the tax relief is 50%. Any gains will be exempt from capital gains tax if the investment is held for three years. Another tax incentive scheme is the Venture Capital Trust, also known as a VCT. The maximum investment you can make is 200,000 pounds per annum, and you receive income tax relief of 30%. Any dividend income received will be exempt from tax, and any gains will also be exempt from capital gains tax. The patent box is designed to encourage companies to keep and commercialize intellectual property in the UK. It allows companies to pay a reduced tax rate of 10%, and moving on to research and development relief, um, this supports companies that work on innovative projects in science and technology. It's a pretty generous relief and it's provided up to 20-30% of expenditure incurred. You can claim a tax credit if the company is loss making. My final presentation is on the changes in capital gains tax reporting for foreigners owning property in the UK. For a number of years, the UK has been a tax haven for property ownership by foreigners who are now look, who are looking to invest in residential and commercial properties in the UK. However, the distinct advantage has been solely eroded in the last five years as governments around the world try to increase revenue to balance the books. Since 6 April 2020, both UK residents and non-UK residents now have a 30-day capital gains filing and tax payment deadline. If there's a sale or disposal of a residential property, which also includes gift of properties. 
An individual return must be completed per disposal in addition to the annual self-assessment tax return, increasing the compliance burden for taxpayers. Within 30 days, the capital gains tax on the disposal must be calculated, taking into account any available tax relief and losses. In addition, the capital gains tax payable must be also approximated based on the expected tax bracket. As mentioned previously, the capital gains tax rates for assessment properties remains at 18% for basic rate taxpayers and 28% for higher and additional rate taxpayers. There's been rumors that the government is trying to increase the capital gains tax rates to bring them in line with income tax rates where the maximum amount is 45%. That will be a huge game changer for the capital gains tax um, legislation. There are exemptions for filing requirements, and this includes when individuals sell their main home, which has been occupied since purchase. This will generally be covered by the private resident relief exemption. If the disposal is at no gain, no loss, and there's no tax due, then the disposal will be exempt from filing requirements. The new legislation will mainly impact those with second homes in the UK and those owning rental properties. When calculating the gains, the 2020-21 annual capital gains tax allowance of £12,300 can be also taken into account. Furthermore, HMRC have confirmed that there will be late filing penalties and interest charges on any unpaid tax. Since April 2015, non-resident who sell a UK resident property are subject to UK capital gains tax and the disposal must be reported within 30 days of completion. If the property was owned prior to 6 April 2015, unlike regular capital gains tax calculations, the three possible methods with which you can be used to calculate the capital gains with the ability to choose the best and most beneficial method. First choice is you can calculate a gain based on market value as of 6 April 2015 an actual sale, uh, property sale price. The second option is to time a portion. The gain by calculating total gain from the date of purchase is, is made to the sale and time apportioning the total gain for the period from 6th April 2015 to sale date. If the land or property was sold for less than it cost. It is possible to calculate loss over the whole period of ownership, but the way the loss is calculated are restricted. Other considerations to take into account is that if the individual had previously lived in the property as their main home, private residence relief may apply to the calculation. In case where the private property was uh, purchased post 6th April 2015, the whole gain is chargeable. Since 6th April 2019, non-residents are now also subject to capital gains tax on disposal of UK land and property which are not residential properties. Similar to non-resident capital gains tax for residential properties, if the land or property was owned prior to 6th April 2019, the individual is only subject to tax on the portion of the gain that accrued from 6th April 2019 to a sale date. However, for non-resident properties, there are only two options to calculate the gain and there's no option to use the time apportionment method. So you'll need to calculate the gain based on market value as a 6 April 2019, an actual property sale price. If the, land was, if the property or land was sold for less than it cost, it is possible to calculate the loss over the whole period of ownership, but the way in which losses can be utilized are restricted. I'll now discuss the changes that will apply to new standard land tax, also known in short as SDLT surcharge that will apply to non-residents in the UK. So from 1st April 2021, non-UK resident individuals purchasing residential properties in the England or Northern Ireland will be subject to an additional 2% SDLT surcharge in comparison to UK residents purchasing a property. However, the residency for SDLT purposes will be based on the UK, will not be based on UK's statute residency tests, but the simpler uh, 183 day test um, rule. 
If the purchaser was resident in the UK for 183 days in a, any continuous 365 day period before or after completion of the transaction, they'll be regarded as UK resident and hence not subject to this surcharge. In addition, if you become resident post completion, it is possible to request a refund of the 2% surcharge. Due to COVID-19, the government has introduced incentives to stimulate the housing market. So individuals who wish to take advantage of the SDLT ex exemption until 31st March 2021, with a potential savings of up to 15,000 pounds in SDLT. For property purchases from 8 July 2020 to 31st March 2021, there's been a temporary reduction of the SDLT rate of to 0% for residential properties of up to half a million pounds. Non-resident individuals who may purchase properties post 1st April 2021 could potentially pay up to 25,000 pounds in SDLT in comparison to buying prior to 31st March 2021 due to the additional 2% surcharge and the cessation of temporary reduction. Now, please note that the 3% surcharge for additional properties will continue to apply throughout this period. I thought it would be uh, brief, uh, useful to briefly discuss the standard land tax in the UK. SDLT tax is payable on land and property transactions in England and Northern Ireland. Property transaction in Scotland is subject to land and business transaction tax, also known as LBTT while in Wales is subject to land transaction tax. This slide shows the SDLT rates that are applicable for residential properties in the UK. Uh, you, the, the rates are on, this, on the slides itself and which will be shared uh, subsequent to this presentation. So these rates are applicable until 31st March, 2021. This slide shows the SDLT rates that are applicable to non-residential properties in the UK. And the rates are also applicable until 31st March 2021. I know that there's been a lot to take in during this presentation. But if you have any specific questions, please email me on alan at lawrencegrant.co.uk. And that's the end of my presentation. And I'll now hand you back to Vandana. Stop sharing my screen. Hello everyone, um, thank you Alan. So as um, uh, Alf mentioned, my name is Vandana, I'm the Managing Director and a Senior Solicitor at Davenport Solicitors, a law firm supporting SMEs um, with their HR support, corporate immigration and employment law. Today I'm going to cover a couple of things. Firstly, an investor, the investor visa, a representative and overseas business visa, visa for migrant workers, the types of visas that are available, employing migrant workers in the UK, so how companies can employ migrant workers in the UK, and just the a basic overview of employment law in the UK and why um, it is relevant. So <clears throat> investor visas are for high net worth individuals um, who, um, who want to invest in the UK. You can apply for this particular visa if you want to invest two million pounds or more in the UK. You must be outside of the EEA and, um, and Switzerland, and you must have access to that two million pounds investment funds to make that application. In addition, you must be over 18 years old and must prove that the money belongs to either you or your husband, wife, unmarried or same sex partner. You must show that you have opened an account with a UK regulated bank to use your funds. And your funds must be held in one or more regulated financial institutions and must be free to spend in the UK. When applying for this particular visa, the funds can, the, the funds can be either in the UK or overseas. You will need to provide evidence showing that you have that required investment funds. And if you are using your own money, then you will need to show how and where you got that money from 
where that money came from, um, if, it's if it's been with you for less than two years. So for example, you might have inherited it from a family member or a relative. And, and where is that money being held at that time? You also need to show that the money can be transferred to the UK and converted to sterling if it's not ready in the UK. If it's your partner's money, then you'll need to provide a certificate, a marriage certificate or a civil partnership certificate or in the case of unmarried or same-sex relationships, proof that you have been in a long-term relationship um, and that's for at least two years. You'll also need a statement from your partner confirming that you will be able to control the funds in the UK and a le letter from a legal advisor stating that the declaration is valid. There are, are many other documents that you need to provide, but one of the most crucial documents that you need to provide is a letter um, from um, a UK bank. And that letter must show um, that you have an account with a UK regulated bank to use for your investment. The letter has to be uh, very specific. Um, so the letter must have been issued by an authorised official at the bank, be dated within three months of your, your application, be on the official head paper of the bank, state your name and your account number, confirm that you've opened your account with the bank in order to invest the two million pounds. Also confirm that the bank is regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority and confirms that confirm that money laundering checks have been carried out. You may need to provide additional information um, depending on your circumstances. There is a fee, a home office fee, when you make this application, which is £1,623. And uh, you also need to pay an immigration health surcharge and currently um, approximately £624 per year. Um, and that applies to most um, immigration and visa applications um, made in the UK. Moving on to the representative overseas a business, a visa, which is um, quite a popular visa um, that companies um, proceed with. With this particular visa, you can apply to come to the UK as a representative of an overseas business if you're from outside the EEA and Switzerland, and you're either the sole representative of an overseas business planning to set up either a UK branch or a wholly owned subsidiary, um, or an employee of an overseas newspaper, news agency or broadcasting organisation posted on a long-term assignment into the UK. You need to show that you are opening the first um, UK presence in, in the UK. Um, and for this um, application, you do need to prove that prove your knowledge of English um, and also pay the immigration health surcharge. And the cost of the application for the, the home office fees is £610. Um, as a representative of an overseas uh, business, uh, you are able to work full time for your employer. You can also bring your dependents, your family members to the UK um, and also apply to extend this particular visa. Eventually you can apply to settle in the UK if you've been here for five years, but you cannot work for anybody else besides your um, employer on this particular visa. And uh, you cannot stay in the UK if the sole rep representative arrangement um, has ended with your employer. It, in relation to this particular one, there's uh, this particular visa, there are um, certain criteria in terms of switching um, into LV categories as well. Um, and you also can't get any public funds with this particular visa. If you're coming to the UK, um, you must be recruited and employed outside the UK by active and trading business. And so your employment contract must be with your overseas employer um, and not with a UK um, employer. You must hold a senior position within the business, um, but must not control the majority shares in that business um, and have full authority to make decisions on its behalf. You intend to establish the overseas business first commercial presence in the UK, either as a registered branch or a wholly owned subsidiary. And you may also you, meet, you must be must have the necessary skills, experience and knowledge to do that particular role. You may also be eligible to um, apply for this visa if the business has a legal entity in the UK that does not employ staff or do business. If your employer has been working um, to establish a UK branch or subsidiary, but it's not yet set up, you can replace the previous sole representative. 
With any um, immigration application to the UK, evidence, providing evidence is key. Um, and in, for this particular visa, you will need to provide um, your passport, um, evidence that you can support yourself and dependents, um, such as the uh, pay slips and bank statements. You'll need to show that you can meet the English requirement. And um, for, some, for most countries, there's a TB test that you need to also provide. If there's any documents that are not in English, they need to be translated um, and there should be a certified translation of any of those documents. In addition, um, there's quite a lot of information that a business needs to provide um, in relation to the overseas business, such as a full description of the business activities, including details of the assets and accounts. You also need to provide a letter confirming the overseas business will set up a wholly owned subsidiary or register as a branch in the UK in the same business activity as it runs overseas. You'll need to provide your job description, your employment contract and salary details, and a letter confirming that you're familiar with the business and have the power to take operational decisions. You should also provide evidence that you are directly employed by the business and not acting as a sales agent, that you were recruited to the business outside of the UK and that you hold a senior position within that business and will be, and will be working full time for that particular business. Um, one of the things that's really important to know is that you don't hold your you don't hold the majority shares in the company. Now when you when you when you're in the UK um, and you've set up your branch um, or and you're trading, um, one thing you might want to consider is employing staff. Um, and this might be from overseas. So it's important to understand how you are able to um, access um, a global talent. In the UK, any organization who wishes to recruit migrant workers um, has to apply for a sponsorship license. And it's only when they have a sponsorship license that they are able to recruit from overseas. The application um, is an online application which needs to be completed. Um, and although organizations can get assistance from lawyers and agents um, and representatives, the submission button must be pressed by the organization. The Home Office have clearly indicated that um, any other representatives should not press the submit button. Tier twos and five of the point-based system are the primary immigration routes for EEA migrant workers who wish to work in the UK. These migrants must be sponsored by an organization that holds a tier two um, or a tier five license before they can come into the UK, work and live here. A license is a permission given to an organization by UK Visa and Immigration, also known as UKVI, to sponsor workers in its business. And the organization is then known as a sponsor. Only organizations not the people can be recognized as sponsors. Now sponsorship plays two main roles in the migrant's application for permission to come to or remain in the UK to work. When appropriate, it provides evidence that the migrants will fill a genuine vacancy at the sponsor that cannot be filled by a suit suitably qualified or skilled settled worker. It involves a pledge from the sponsor that it accepts all the duties accepted when sponsoring the migrant. Organisations that apply for a sponsorship licence must be able to meet the eligibility and suitability criteria for sponsors. And there is a guidance that the Home Office has provided, which is easily accessible on their website. To confirm that the organisation is a eligible sponsor license, it must provide UKVI with the necessary supporting documents to evidence that it is a genuine business and has um, an operating or trading presence in the UK. If it doesn't have an operating or trading presence in the UK, then it cannot apply for a sponsorship license. For this particular application, there is a fee and for small um, or charitable organisations, um, it, there's a fee of £536. You're regarded as a small business if your annual turnover is at £10.2 million or, and you have 50 or fewer employees. If you are a medium or large organisation, then there is a fee of £1,476 and that's a one-off fee. 
So as I mentioned, uh, they are the, the primary routes for migrant workers is the tier two and the tier five. Um, tier two is split into two categories, um, the ICT visa, which is the intercompany transfer visa, and um, a general visa. The general visa is for skilled workers looking to work in the UK for a long term, uh, on a long term basis. And uh, usually the visa is granted for three years um, initially, and the applicant can then make an application for an extension whilst in the UK um, for another two years. And once they have five years, they can apply for um, what's known as indefinite leave to remain. The tier two ICT visa, which is the intercompany transfer is for skilled workers who are employed by an overseas linked company of the UK sponsor, and who want to come to the UK for a limited period. The tier five um, enables sponsored non-EEA and non-Swiss Swiss nationals to live and work in the UK for short periods of time. And these industry, industries may include the creative and sporting industry, charity or religious workers. With, um, both, with, with both of these categories, a sponsor who has made an application and, and is recognized as a sponsor in the UK, we need to issue um, what's known as a certificate of sponsorship. Um, that then certificate of sponsorship is allocated to um, the individual who would need the number to apply for their visa. So how do you apply for a sponsorship license? It's pretty simple. Um, it's an online application. And once you've made that application, um, you need to provide the supporting documents within, uh, within five working, for, for five working um, days. The online um, um, application should be submitted once the authorizing officer and an authorized officer is um, someone with responsibility um, who the organization appoint to deal with the, 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 the sponsorship license. Um, so once the, spon once the authorizing officer is satisfied with the UK organization having the necessary systems in place to comply with its sponsor duties and obligations um, and all the supporting documents are in order, they are ready to submit the application to a UK VI. Once the sponsorship license has been submitted, um, along with the documents, a, a, a um, submission sheet will be generated, which needs to accompany the supporting documents and be sent um, to UK VI. Um, the, um, the decision can take up to eight weeks, um, although generally speaking, decisions are made within four weeks. Um, if it is a straightforward application and everything goes well. There are going to be documents that you need to submit and uh, some of those documents are, are listed on, 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 in my presentation. Um, generally, my view is that there's certain documents um, that are easily accessible by organisations. Um, so uh, for instance, uh, the lease, um, the rental agreement of the, or, uh, the, the company, bank statements, a letter, from HMRC confirming the PAYE details and VAT details. Um, you have to provide four documents, it has to be either original or certified, but in, in, most of my clients are able to provide those documents so it's easier um, to obtain. But there is a whole host of other documents that can be provided to the Home Office. Along with those documents, you do need to provide some additional information, in particular the hierarchy chart, which has to detail the owner, the director and board members. And if the organisation has 50 or fewer employees, then they need to be able to set out the names, the jobs of all those staff members. The Home Office requires organisations to tell them about the jobs that are vacant and that they wish to fill. And you need to identify this something called a SOCO, which is the Standard Occupational Classification. Again, um, it can be um, easily accessible on, on, inter on the internet. Um, so you need to identify the correct SOC code and link it to the job title. You need to provide the job description, which outlines the duties required. And where does that position sit on the hierarchy chart? You also need to set out the minimum salary that you will guarantee if the job was available. The UKVI may carry out a compliance visit either before granting the sponsorship license or after. Some of them are, sometimes the UKVI does not give notice to organisations. So it's very important that organisations have the necessary systems in place 
um, before there is a visit. And when I talk about systems, it's really very much um, the HR systems. Um, so are you able to track when your migrant worker is not going to be in the office or has left? When is their visa coming to an end? Have you got a system which gives you alerts? Um, and uh, do you have contracts, employments and staff handbooks? How are you monitoring um, your staff members and are you doing right to work checks? So in summary, um, complete the online application, which includes the declaration um, and ensure that you meet the eligibility and suitability criteria, pay the correct fee, provide the proof that you are a UK based employer um, and that you are, a, and you are trading um, lawfully in the UK. Great. Um, from there is uh, obviously there's massive changes as you may may know already um, with the Brexit and from 1st of January 2021 freedom of movement between the UK and EU will end and the UK will introduce an immigration system that will treat all applicants equally regardless of where they come from. Anyone who wants to recruit from outside the UK excluding Irish citizens will need to apply for permission first. The requirements are very different from for each visa. The new system will not apply to EEA or Swiss citizens who you already employ in the UK. The, 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 the EU nationals who are already in the UK must apply for the EU under the EU settlement scheme and obtain pre-settled or settled status. And they have until the 30th of June, 2021 to do so. From the 1st of January 2021, anyone you recruit from outside the UK for the, skill, for, skill, for the skilled worker room will need to demonstrate that they have a job offer from a home office licensed sponsor, that they speak English at the required level. The job offer is at the required skill level, which is RQF3 or above, which is different to what it is at the moment. So um, it's equivalent to A level. Um, RQF3, they'll be paid at least 25,600 or the going rate for the job offer, whichever is higher. And if the job will pay less than this, but no less than 20,480 pounds, the applicant may still be able to apply by trading points on specific characteristics against their salary. For example, if they have a job offer on the shortage occupation and more of a PhD relevant to the job. Finally, just an overview on the basic employment law um, in, in the UK. So almost all workers are legally entitled to 5.6 weeks pay holiday per year, um, and employers must ensure that they provide the employees with that correct minimum holiday entitlement. An employer can include bank holidays as part of the annual leave. Employees must not work more than 48 hours per week over an average period of 17 weeks, unless they agree in writing to do so. So you, you, organizations should consider whether to have an agreement in place with their employees to allow them to do that. Setting up a business in the UK is, 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 it could, can be daunting and it's important to know that there are several types of employment relationships in the UK. If you're engaging people to work for you or take carry out work on uh, for you, then they're generally going to be regarded as a worker or an employee, unless it's very clear that the relationship is one of a self-employed, self-employed basis. As soon as you become an employer, it is advisable to um, obtain employer's liability insurance from an authorized insurer. This insurance will help you pay for compensation if an employee is injured or becomes ill because of the work that they do for you. In the event that the employer is unable to produce a valid certificate upon request, they may be liable to pay significant fines. All workers in the UK must show that they have the legal right to work in the UK, regardless of their background. The government provides a checklist of documents that must be produced by a prospective employee in order to show that they are eligible to work in the UK. As an employer, you must ensure that you have seen the original documents of the prospective employee and have checked the, its validity. Every employee on the day, first day of their, um, the first day they start work must be provided with, the, um, with a written statement of the terms and conditions of employment 
also known as the contract of employment. And it's important to note that there is a minimum wage in the UK and the national minimum wage is £8.72 per hour for those individuals who are 25 years and over. And that's it for me. So thank you so much for listening and I'll pass it back to Al. Great. Well, Alan and Vandana, thank you very much for a really um, interesting and wide ranging um, presentation. Um, living in Moscow, um, I can clearly see that uh, governments in general love bureaucracy. And uh, as you say, it's quite daunting to uh, um, get through the immigration process both ways. Anyways, we've got a great um, series of questions. Um, well, let's go straight to the first one. Um, and the question is, how will Brexit affect commercial property prices in the UK, in particular retail property? And when do you think the best time is to buy with Brexit in mind? That question for me, Alf, I think. <laughs> if, if I got a crystal ball, Alf, I probably know what, what to buy and what not to buy before and yes. after Brexit. Well, I think generally from my presentation, I mentioned that the warehousing is obviously an area where there's a huge demand for that and the prices are not going to come down. And my clients are finding it difficult to acquire and rent properties in that area. How retail sector is obviously an area where um, there's still obviously a huge um, space available and, and, and landlords are finding difficult to rent because of the COVID. People are now working from home uh, and the land space is gonna be changed completely post COVID and post Brexit. So, you know, I, I presume it's probably better to wait for, um, for retail space to be available post Brexit. But in terms of warehousing, I don't think you should wait because You've got companies looking to move into the UK from Europe um, and basically everyone's got online trading. They'll need warehousing space. So yeah, that's the short question about right. answer to that. Thank you. Okay, um, the next question is uh, for non-UK based investors acquiring UK based assets, is a UK company the best vehicle to acquire? I think I would always advise always these uh, individuals come to do business in the UK to set up a limited company because that gives you a limited library um, protection for a start. And um, also depends on the type of asset because some of the assets could be, if it's a free or property, then you need to take tax advice as to what's the best vehicle to put into, whether, whether, it's, a whether it's a company or whether it's in, in a personal name. That's quite an important uh, decision to make. Um, but generally it's, it's yes, limited company is the best option going forward. Okay, great, thank you. Um, uh, another straightforward question here. Is there um, capital gains tasks, a tax on properties owned outside of the UK? Well, if you're a UK resident, UK domicile in the UK, then you're subject to worldwide taxes. Mm -hmm. So if you own a property abroad and you sell a property abroad, then you have to report it in the UK. But if you're coming from abroad, so the first seven years, seven of the nine years, you only report income, uh, UK source income. So you got this short window of space to basically deal with properties outside the UK without having to report to the UK. But after the seven years, um, you can still elect to um, to basically be taxed on an arising or remittance basis, and depending on which election you make, uh, if you don't want to disclose the, the property that's sold abroad, you have to pay a tax of £30,000 on top of your normal tax that you pay in the UK. And if you've been in the UK for, what, um, 12 to 14 years, then there's an additional tax of £60,000 to pay. So there's an option of not paying the capital gains that's um, that's incurred abroad by selling a property abroad for those who are basically non-domiciled in the UK. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, a question for Vandana, I think. Um, if a candidate has a tier two visa and has a UK university degree, how does it change the application evaluation? And furthermore, how does a company prove that the UK skillful worker or a UK skillful worker couldn't fill that position? hence the company hiring an overseas candidate? So at the moment, there's a, um, a resident labour market test that organisations um, have to carry out. But if the individual was already in the UK on a, on a, on a tier four, if they were a student, then they could be um, exempt from the resident labour market test. But generally speaking, that's the route that they would take. But if, if someone's already in the UK and on a tier two visa, then you should be able to switch to other employment. And I hope that answers, uh, answers that question. But um, I'm, I'm not sure, obviously it's very specific, so I'm not sure whether or not he's already in the, on a tier two or he wants to apply for a tier two, but if it's about how do they prove whether or not they can, either that person, that job has to be on the shortage occupation list and it's exempt, or they're a student and therefore could be exempt as well. 
otherwise they will have to go through a base, resident labour market test. After 1st January, then the um, rules change and the resident labour market test is going to be abolished. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm sure if Daniel's got any further follow up on that, he'll get in contact. Um, another question, uh, is there any change in the 12 month continuous period requirement for ILR due to the coronavirus in 2020 or even in 2021 if it continues? Um, the Home Office is obviously, um, you know, providing guidance on a regular basis because of the impact that it has had on uh, applications and obviously people being outside of the country when they didn't want to be outside the country for that long. So there has been some communication in relation to that, but there's going to be more updates. And uh, all I'd say is just keep, you know, you either visit our website or um, visit the home, uh, the home Office's website for regular updates in relation to those requirements changing. Great. Okay. Um, th there's a final question, um, and I'd like to ask um, Lilia Scott, if she doesn't mind, to ask it herself. Um, it, it feels a little bit nuanced, so uh, if, if you're there, Lilia, if you don't mind um, unmuting yourself and asking it yourself. Oh, hi there. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for such a good presentation. Um, my question is in relation to uh, Seoul representative. Um, if sole representatives uh, are in the UK, do you see uh, do you see that there is a problem if they open a limited company and become a sole director and shareholder of the company, but will call it a branch of their main business that was um, that has sent them to the UK? They cannot be a, a director or and, and be a majority shareholder in a UK company. And if they are, they will have problems when they apply for an extension of their visa. Is you know the the main um, the main criteria is that they only work for that company that they're employed by overseas, um, and they can't hold the majority shares. Um, I've had successful applications. Um, uh, on solar representatives when they were directors of the UK branch. They were not majority shareholders because the main business was the majority shareholder and they um, only had 5% shares, but they were the sole director of the business. Otherwise, how can you open the branch in the UK? So we've had that issue as well recently, actually, um, and when we've had, dealt with a client who had struggled to open up a bank account because he um, he 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 wasn't our director, and he went off and he went and um, became a shareholder in the organisation, and um, he then applied for an extension and his visa's been his visas was um, refused, um, and he actually said he he said I didn't there was no other way I could have done it to obtain a um, a um, a UK bank account, so. I'm not sure, I mean, obviously, I'm not sure of um, the, the full circumstance of where, you know, your, the, the details of what you're explaining. But from my experience, um, I think that organisations would struggle, um, the individual would struggle, particularly if they were to become a director in other organisations or even that uh, the organisation that they're employed by in the U overseas and open up a branch in the UK. Thank you so much. You you are totally right here because we've got two issues. There are immigration requirements and also um, the hurdles that we have to go through with the banks. And even if you hold shares on trust um, to pass the compliance for someone who's never been to the UK is almost impossible if you, especially if you're not a director. Um, yeah, no, thank it's, you. It's, we'll it's, see how and um what i would say and i say this to my clients is just hold you know hold thought for five years you know and and let somebody in the uk become the director if that needs to and make it easier for you to open up a bank account um that's what my advice would be only because otherwise it becomes so difficult and you know it's there's, there's so many so many things linked to it because the individual has family, children settled and, and is studying and it disrupts their lifestyle so much. But I understand what you're saying and I've, can't, I've, I've seen people go through that myself and it is, you know, it's very complicated. But the advice that I give to my clients is just don't don't become a director. Just 
do things by the book for five years at least. And then once you've got ILR, then you can do whatever you want. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much once again, Alan Vandana. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. Um, thank you for a, a really interesting and um, comprehensive talk. As I said at the beginning, um, all the details of uh, both Alan and Vandana are on the website. Um, and uh, if you want to get in contact with them, go direct, of course, or if, um, if that proves problematic, just come to us and, and we'll get you in contact. Thank you very much everyone for attending. I know it's always difficult taking time out during the day. I'm glad to see everyone here. Uh, please join us again next week where we uh, our busy schedule continues. We have two webinars next week, one on logistics and cy supply chain issues um, between UK and Russia, and uh, a f uh, another uh, webinar um, on insurance matters. So I hope you'll join us then. All the... Um, all, all the details are on the website as always. Anyways, Vandana, thank you. Alan, thank, thank you. you very much. And um, yeah. pleasant rest of the day. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. Bye.